with American troops facing the enemy on the field of battle, I would not be living up to my oath of office if I fail to do whatever is required to provide them with weapons and ammunition they need for their survival. Therefore, I am taking two actions. First, I am directing the Secretary of Commerce to take possession of the steel mills. The issue in this story is the power of the President and its limits. Not often is the President's authority directly attacked in a lawsuit, but that is what happened in the administration of Harry S. Truman in the second year of the Korean War, when he ordered the federal government to seize the major steel mills of the United States. The legality of that action, debated with intense feeling, was finally resolved by the United States Supreme Court. This is the story of its ruling and the conflict that led to it. The story of a president's power contested. Chief Justice Rehnquist's book, he talks about how once they granted certiorari, Justice Jackson suggested a somewhat offhand way that both George and I should familiarize ourselves with the briefs in the case when they came in. Uh, but he certainly gave no indication at that point to me at any rate of any leanings he might have had. What was the buzz? Well, my take on all that, because I've been, uh, recently I commented in a note to the Chief Justice how the nature of the cases that come before the court has changed from our time. And we don't have the issues we have now. And then he reminded me, oh, don't forget the Steel Caesar case. And I hadn't forgotten it. I took away from the court a complete set of the briefs in that case. I have no idea where they are now. At some point in some house cleaning out they went. But um, my memory of the case is not as distinct as Bill's. Mm -hmm. I remember, obviously, you couldn't help but be impressed by it and um, the importance of it. But the thing that stuck in my mind at the time, almost more than anything else, was how quickly it moved. Okay. You know, it was in and it was gone. Among the clerks, was there a lot of speculation as to what was going on? And maybe I should stop and for the benefit of, of those who didn't have the benefit of reading the book, uh, maybe give just a quick overview of, of what the issue was. Well, boy, it would, I should have reread it if you're going to ask me things like that. <laughs> the case was Youngstown Sheeton's Tube Company v. Sawyer. Mm -hmm. I believe the steel companies were threatened to be shut down as a strike. So President Truman couldn't have that. This was the Korean War. So he issued a proclamation seizing the steel mills. And, well, that was not well received. <laughs> At the, to make a long story short, they, um, uh, that case moved faster than any I've ever seen. And. Uh, in nothing flat, it was at the Supreme Court. Um, the His recollection of, of course, he's there, we can reread stuff. His recollection of it is a lot more clear than mine. Of course, we all knew it was a very significant case, and it was interesting. And word came that the United States Supreme Court had agreed to give the case an early hearing, meanwhile, barring any changes in wages. At this news, compromise became unlikely. Now the scene shifted to the United States Supreme Court. Its ruling came on June 2nd. By a 6-3 to three decision, it ruled the seizure unconstitutional. A minority of three justices felt the emergency justified the president's action. A majority of six felt it did not and said the president had usurped the legislative function of Congress. Wonderful story about the justices' conference that Friday at which they voted on the case in private. What, what do you remember about that? Well, as I say, I, what I, of course, the clerks weren't present at the conference, but uh, George Niebank, my co-clerk, and I were just as dying to find out what happened, as I suspect all the other clerks were, too. So we followed Justice Jackson into his office when he got back, just as we always did, and he would tell us what happened at conference. And he said, well, boys, the president got licked. <laughs>
And Justice Jackson's concurring opinion in the Steele seizure case is generally regarded by constitutional scholars as the most significant. What did he say about presidential powers, and why did he write separately? Well, I think he wrote separately because uh, almost everybody did write separately. I, I think you know, the opinions had to be prepared in a fairly short time, and I think even those who agreed with Justice Black's outcome felt that there needed to be more said about the thing. And Justice Jackson's uh, concurring opinion classified presidential power in three different ways. First, where he was acting with the approval of Congress, and there Jackson said, <clears throat> only, if the only if the whole government is disabled does he lose. Second, uh, where he's acting uh, without congressional auth authorization, but without congressional disapproval, and there it's kind of a middle ground. And finally, what Jackson felt had happened in the Steele seizure case, where he was acting in an area where Congress said, don't do what you want to do, do something else. And there he said the power is at its uh, nadir. The result surprised nobody. And it didn't surprise me. And an interesting aside in that, uh, after they announced the decision at that time, uh, Tom Clark, uh, sat on one side of uh, Jackson, probably on the left, and uh, Tom Clark announced his uh, uh, concurrence, and I don't remember whether he wrote an opinion or not, but uh, Jackson leaned over to him and whispered, I'm glad to see that you've decided to be a judge, Tom. <laughs> now Jackson told me that, mm -hmm. and I'm sure he did. And that was on decision day. That's yes, it. when they announced the decision from the, from the bench. Right. That's not what Harry Truman thought Tom Clark had become. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> but at, uh, at that point, it became clear that uh, Tom Clark had become a judge. Right. Even Justice Clark, Truman's former attorney general, came down on the other side. It's quite a sweeping decision. Five justices wrote concurring opinions agreeing with Black's conclusion, but taking slightly different paths to get there. We look back now at Justice Jackson's opinion as the most important one. He's essentially saying that there are three categories or three ways of considering presidential action. And it goes like this. First, if the president's actions are backed by law or the implied authorization of Congress, the president is at the height of his powers. He's pretty much in the clear to act. Second, if the president acts but there is no law or Congress, as they say, is silent, not with him or against him, then the president is in what Jackson called a zone of twilight, where he and Congress have found some middle ground. It's not ideal, more like a definite maybe as to whether the president can act. Third, if he acts against the will of Congress, that is, Congress has either expressly written a law saying he can't do something, or implied he can't, as in the case of Taft-Hartley, where Congress chose not to give him the power to act, then presidential power is at its weakest. And if they have to, the courts can step in to stop him. Jackson applied that measure to steal seizure. Now, a few months after that, um, uh, Justice Black used to have a dinner for the Supreme Court over in his home in Alexandria mm -hmm. after the close of every session. And um, uh, they were, the, this particular evening, all the justices were there and they had dinner, and the president used to come. Well, President Truman was there. And they got to talking, evidently, about the steel seizure case. And, you know, Truman said to them, you know, he said, I almost came up to argue that case myself. <laughs> and Justice Douglas leaned over and clapped him on the knee and said, why didn't you do it? <laughs> oh, it uh, happily, he didn't. Yeah the lasting significance of the steel seizure case as we look back in constitutional history 50 years? Well, I think the subsequent opinions of the court have adopted Justice Jackson's concurrence. And th that kind of trifurcation is probably its, its uh, contribution. Uh, I think people have, have expressed the view that uh, had it come up in time of declared war, it might have come out differently. And so, you know, it's just one of many cases in this area, but I think the Jackson concurrence has uh, been pretty much what it stood for.